please rise. day. I hope you guys are enjoying this summer weather. Thank you so much for being here with us this morning and for joining us online. We welcome you as well. Well, this morning we're going to declare the holiness of God. Our God is the one and only true God, and he is holy, magnificent, and mighty. And it is a great privilege for us to honor him and lift him up and glorify him together as the body of Christ. So let us sing, holy, holy, holy. to read from the scriptures this morning from Psalms 86. I will give thanks to you, O Lord my God, with all of my heart, and I will glorify your name forever, for your loving kindness toward me is great. It is our wonderful privilege and obligation to glorify God, to lift him high, that we might decrease, that he might increase, that he would be magnified. And today we're going to glorify God the Father, Jesus Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so join us in just a reflective time of worship with glorify thy name.
So uh, last night, I don't know how many of you guys do this, every now and then it's kind of fun to watch some YouTube videos, and I've been watching some on gardening, okay? I know, it's weird, but I've been watching on gardening. Now, lest you think I need to give in my man card, last night I decided to watch this YouTube video on how they catch king crabs at low tide, because that interests me, okay? You're walking around in muck up to your ankle, well, it's like about a foot deep, and you're trying not to step on these king crabs, Okay? So it was really a, a cool video, all right? The guy reaches down, and you can tell this kid had done this. He reached down in the holes, pulls these things out by hand. I'm like, that guy is nuts, all right? But at one point, they, they got the pincher stuck out because they're trying to get whatever's passing by. So they had their pincher stuck out. And you're sitting there, okay, that's kind of cool. You can kind of see where they are. I like that. And I got it, Miles. My mind, people who know me will tell you that my mind is wired a little bit differently because I see something, and immediately I'm like, squirrel, right? So I, I get distracted easily. Thinking of the king crab and their pinchers reminded me of a classic dad joke that I'm going to tell you today. <laughs> All right? I see some heads shaking and some grimacing going on. I will pray for your souls. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. You love me. You can blame this one on my, on my son, who actually yesterday reminded me of this one. How do king crabs enjoy their tea? With just a pinch of sugar. Oh, yeah, that's good. Now, Father's Day is coming up. I've got to get you guys primed because on Father's Day, we do dad jokes on Father's Day. So we've got to get you primed just a little bit. Because I'm sugar? Uh, no, I've been pinched, all right? Don't ask questions. Uh, but So next week come, well, actually, I hope this doesn't scare you away next week, but there will be some more for your enjoyment and your worshipful pleasure next week. It'll be good. All right, a few things. Pull your bulletins out. I did actually watch a video on king crabs. You really should. It's kind of fun. King crabs. Getting pink king crabs at low tide. It was really fascinating. All right, now I know how I can live in a situation like that. So now we know. All right, guys, a couple things. In the back of your bulletins here, if you didn't get one, raise your hand. We'll get one to you. Anybody? While on this topic, actually, I'm going to change subjects for just a second. See, I heard a squirrel. I saw one somewhere. Eric in the back, he has some, there's some, well, uh, they're helping people with, a, with a hearing impairments, all right? So if you have a little bit of struggles hearing me, I know understanding is hard because I talk really fast. For that, I apologize. That's not going to get fixed, okay? The only remedy I have for that is that the sermons are recorded, and you can go on a YouTube and play it at three-quarter speed, and people tell me it's about normal, all right? So if you need that, you can have it. But in the back, Eric has these hearing impaired devices. Sievert has been wearing them. Sievert loves them, right? Because they work really, really well. And so if you need one of those, just go to the sound booth. Eric will show you how to use it. Or Brian, if he's there, they're very simple to use. They work really well. So if you come in and you're just having a hard time or something like that, you can do that. Now, what I don't want because it works on a radio transmitter. I don't want you to come in and then change the channel to some country music station and be back there jamming to the tunes while I'm preaching. Don't do that. So if I'm starting to see teenagers picking these things up, we're going to be a little suspicious here, all right? But they're there. They're available if you guys want them. Okay, now to the bulletin. We'll, we'll get there. Today is a very special day at Grace. This afternoon, Jeff and Vicki Fellers are renewing their wedding vows. It's been 36 years. That's a long time to be married, 36 years. That's awesome. They're going to be renewing their wedding vows this afternoon. You can applaud that. That's worth applauding for sure, guys. 
would like you to come, if you can. That would be your gift to them, is just to come this afternoon at 3 o'clock. We're going to have a, a, just a short, simple ceremony. It's going to be wonderful, and they're going to have a time of fellowship afterwards. So if you just want to come and just encourage them and just show your love on them, I know they'd appreciate that. That'll be this afternoon here at Grace at 3. So just plan on that. This Tuesday is a ladies' luncheon. Details in the bulletin. The women's have an event coming up. The women have an event coming up on June 26. All right? It's an... Well, if you're into arts at all, you're going to enjoy it. They've got all sorts of things they're doing. They're doing pottery. They're doing some door hangers. They're doing some canvas painting, some glass fusion. There's a lot of things they're doing. So if you are a woman, all right, and you want to go, so if you're a teenager, if you're a young lady, if you're an older lady, and you want to attend this event, you are, of course, welcome to do so. But Linda needs to know. And next Sunday is going to be the last Sunday to sign up, all right? So think about it this week if you don't have an answer yet. But talk to Linda. Call her. Her phone number is in the bulletin. She needs to know if you're going to attend this. There are certain costs to it. They're going to be carpooling to Kearney, and it's going to be kind of a great time. So just be aware of that. Then, of course, in two weeks is our outdoor service. We want you guys to be aware of that as well. We're going to have a potluck. Um, we're going to be out just outside of town here a couple miles. Um, so be aware of that. Um, we want you to be part of that. A few other things are there. You guys can just read the bulletin there and get that. One thing I did want to draw attention to is this is our month for a food drive at the local food pantry. We're going to be raising some, some, some foods, collecting some food items, and or cash donations as well for the local food pantry. So if you'd like to contribute to that, you may contribute just to your regular giving, just market food pantry, or you can bring in some items and you can put them in, in each lobby. There's a sign in each lobby. You can bring some food items and it tells you in the bulletin what kind of things they're looking for as well for that. Now, before we get going too far, the missions has a special thing they want to do. Dennis, come on up here. Thank you, Pastor. I have one question. You said on Father's Day you're going to do some bad jokes. Is that any different than any of your other jokes? Or? <laughs> and that was our missions moment. All right, that was our missions <laughs> moment. So, <laughs> Listen. Yeah. Come on up here. Kids. Yeah, everybody online needs to see who's making fun of me. No, you just want me up here because I'm short and you don't yes. think they can see me. Uh, <laughs> the mission committee needs some brotherly love. And in translation, that's help. We need volunteers to do some of the things we're coming up with. One is the lawn chair theater. As theater. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Excuse me. Yes. Uh, we need some people to help set up and... Uh, like pop the popcorn and hand out the pop and stuff. We just had one Friday night, and Shannon was very excited, said it went over very well. So every time we have one of these, we learn something new that helps us with the next one. So anyway, we need some volunteers with that. Then we have the uh, GCA days coming up, and we have the, uh, I don't know how to pronounce that. Linda, how do you pronounce that? Simisaurus. Say that again? The Semisaurus. Yeah, I call it the Creation Museum. It's coming to GCA days, and, and we uh, have some, um, what do you call them, um, disc, you know, that, that you throw, Frisbees. you know, the disc. And Frisbees? we have, it's on there, is, it says the name of the, of the uh, museum coming, and then Grace Church. And we need help handing them out. So if you're going to be there anyway, and you would like to help, hand those out we'd appreciate it pastor gave me five minutes he thinks everybody talks as fast as he does but the last thing we need is a five-day club is coming and uh that is um by the way uh gca days is july 9th and 10th uh the five-day club is the 19th through the 23rd and we need uh several things we need Evening, an evening meal for the pastor and, and, the, and the kids. We need a, a, a meal uh, Monday, Wednesday, and Thursday delivered to the pastor's house. And uh, just to let you know, Tuesday they're having chicken. So, <laughs> so we need some help with that. If, if anybody would like to volunteer with a meal, please uh, let Shannon know about that. Uh, then we need... Um, we need a lot of help for this five-day club. We need some uh, volunteers to donate, like if you want to donate chips or something. But don't just go out and buy them, please. Let Shannon know what you would like to donate so she can keep a running list so we don't have too much of, of one thing. Um, we also need for 
10 o'clock every day of the week, Monday through Friday. We need someone to volunteer a place to have this. We, we need like the yard and a, and a restroom, use of a restroom. And uh, if you could do that, please let Shannon know. That would really help because we have no place for, the, uh, for 10 o'clock. Last, uh, we need someone to, uh, we need to give oaths. And so for them, it's a little bit harder to, to maybe tell the truth in a situation where they're, they, they don't want to hurt the person. Where true speakers, they don't know what the word grace is, right? Hey, they need to hear it. I'm going to tell it to them, okay? That's the way we're going to be. You have, the, you have that, okay? And we need the, the discussion, of course, was can we find the balance? Because there are times you have to tell the truth in love. Oh, we're good. All right. If you come back online just now, realize we lost power. Everything fritzed out on us, and so we're just now getting going. So sorry for halfway through the sermon. We'll live. I can preach another 30 minutes to make up for it, all right? So we'll be good. Okay, I won't. Moving on. All right, bad news. Bad news isn't much fun. Pastor Sunday Day gives it to us straight up, but don't walk out. I don't want you guys to leave today, all right? I know we've had bad news and bad news and bad news, but we're getting to the good part because there's some good news today we're going to look at. Just briefly at the very end, we're going to bring it back here. Father's Day, next Sunday's Father's Day. I'm going to give a Father's Day sermon, but then when we come back, we're going to be talking about this, actually the June 27th, an outdoor service. I don't know what we're going to do in the outdoor service yet either. That may be different too. Eventually, we'll be back to Romans, okay? And when we do, we'll talk about this again. Yeah, you're laughing at me. All right. We're going to have fun today, and we're going to bring it back around here next time we get back to this and talk about this a little bit more. But let's dive in. Let's see what Paul has for us today. In Romans chapter 3, okay? Romans 3. Follow along with me as I read this passage. Romans chapter 3, we're going to be going through 9, verse 22. What then? Are we Jews any better off? Now, I'm going to stop right there for just a second. If you remember, we've been discussing the last few weeks about what it means to be a Jew and a Gentile and, and a Greek, or are we better than they, or are they better than us, and how he was saying it doesn't matter your roots, it doesn't matter your, your doctrinal roots, it doesn't matter your historical roots, none of those roots matter, because in the end, God condemns all of us because of our actions, because of what we are, okay? So he asked a question, are we Jews any better off? No, not at all, we're no better off. For we have already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. Okay? Everyone is under sin. Verse 10. As it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. No one understands, no one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Their throat is an open grave. They use their tongues to deceive. The venom of asps is under their lips. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood, and their paths are ruin and misery, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Verse 19. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. Let's pray together for just a second. God, your word is real. Your word hits us sometimes, uh, hits us where we need to be, where we need to be smacked just a little bit, a little reminder, sometimes gentle, sometimes not so gentle. Today in your word, you, you are going to, you're going to be a true speaker and a grace giver in this passage that we're going to look at today. And Father, I, I appreciate that you are a balanced God that you are a God who, who loves us so much that you see our problem and yet you found a way to fix the problem. You created a way to fix the problem. And Lord, we're going to be looking at both of those things today and I praise you for this passage. Help us to walk through it. Help us to be open to what you have to say to us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, diving in. The first thing to look at in this diagnosis, we're going to understand there's some deficiencies that we have. There are some deficiencies that we have within ourselves. There are some character deficiencies that are missing. So this diagnosis, what's he say in verse 3 and 9? What then, are we Jews any better off? No, not at all. For we've already charged that all, both Jews and Greeks, are under sin. The first thing is, is we're all under this idea of sin. Sin is anything we think, say, or do that does not please God. That's where we are. We're all under sin. And then he says this, as it is written, none is righteous, no, not one. So the first character deficiency that we have as individuals is this. We have a lack of righteousness. We don't have righteousness. This is a key deficiency if we want to have a right relationship with God. 
In order to have a right relationship with God, we have to be righteous like God, right? And we're not. We have a key deficiency, which is righteousness. We are missing this within ourselves. We don't have righteousness. And the thing is, let's, let's, I'm going to jump ahead for just a second. Many of us understand that we can gain God's righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ. All right, we understand that, that God imputes his righteousness upon us. That's a biblical doctrine. The problem is that just because God imputes his righteousness, it doesn't remove the flesh within us. And so while we have God's righteousness within us, we still fight against the flesh all the time. So God's righteousness does not make us perfect. We still have this sin nature within us that's constantly at war. So we don't have righteousness before faith in Christ, after faith in Christ, God's righteousness is imputed to us, but we're still fighting against this. It's still there. There's never a point in our life when we can say, now I have righteousness and I am perfect. Never will you be able to say that until the moment you're glorified, okay? We don't have righteousness. Ecclesiastes chapter 7, verse 20 says this, Surely there is not a righteous man on earth who does good and never sins. And we don't like hearing that, but the truth of it, that's what it is. There is not a righteous man on the earth who does good and never sins. We are all there. We have to understand this. We have to. But then that leads us to the problem of trying to understand this. Paul goes on in Romans chapter 3. He says this, no one understands. How can we have understanding on something that we truly don't understand, right? Who is the person who's most oblivious to sin? The one who has it in their own life. Everyone else can see it, but the person who has it, they don't see it. It's like they're wearing blinders, and we are all guilty of that. I can remember the senior pastor in Omaha telling me once, we was in there and I had a meeting with him, and, and he, said, he, he said, everybody wears blinders to their own sin. That is true. We all have blinders on, blind to our own sin. And Romans chapter 3, verse 11, no one understands is exactly what this is saying. We are not righteous, and to be perfectly honest with you, we don't understand that. We think we're good we, because, because maybe we, we do all these good things, right? If we're not a believer in Christ, we, well, I'm good because of this is what I do, and this is what I do, and I do all these good things. Or we think we're good because God's righteousness has been imputed to us. The truth is, we're not good, and we don't understand it. You want to know really how you are, ask somebody that you're not related to. Ask them, how am I, all right? Your wife's going to be gentle with you. Your husband might be gentle with you. Why? Because they've got to live with you, okay? Ask somebody, all right? They'll tell you, no one really understands their own mess they're in. We don't have understanding. This is a deficiency. We don't have righteousness. We don't have understanding. This is the truth of it. All right. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Why would we seek for God if we don't need God? And because I don't understand that I, don't need, that I need God, then I'm not going to seek him because I don't understand it, right? I know it sounds redundant. It was, but I'm hoping you make a point here just a little bit. We don't seek for God. So our deficiency is we really don't seek God or the things of God. We don't. We have a problem. It's like going to the doctor, and the doctor says, look, you've got a big vitamin deficiency here. Here's how you can fix this. Well, I don't see that I have a vitamin deficiency. I don't need to take that. And so we refuse to take it. In fact, to be perfectly honest with you, we don't even go to the doctor in the first place because it'll be okay. It'll be fine. It's just normal. This is how my dad was, how my mom was. It's just normal, not realizing that we're killing ourselves. Because we truly don't understand. Because we don't understand, we're not seeking what God wants for us. We really don't seek God. We don't want God to tell, thing, tell us things in our life that need to be adjusted. We don't want to hear that from people. We don't want to hear how we have messed up. We don't want to hear the, the ways that we need to grow. We like to hear how other people need to grow. And we like to point to other people how they need to grow. But we don't like when people come to us and say, hey, there's this little deficiency here. Maybe you need to adjust some. We don't like that. And people who don't like that are just proving the truth of God's words that we don't really seek God. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. Romans chapter 3, verse 12. There is nothing good about us. Now who likes to hear this? If your husband comes up to you and says, Honey, man, I love you. There is just nothing good about you. That would just be real nice, wouldn't it? Not so much. Okay, my wife and I are going on an anniversary trip. We're planning on leaving town tonight. We're going to be gone for a few days, taking some vacation time. If we get there tonight in Omaha and we're getting ready to go Goodwilling tomorrow morning, and she says, honey, I love Goodwilling with you, but there's just really nothing good about you, that would be a great way to start that trip, let me tell you. I'm like, you have fun, sweetheart. I'm going to go find some friends, all right? This will be a good time. I will prove to you there is nothing good about me, okay? 
The problem is that every single day we prove the truth of this, that deep down we are all fighting the flesh, and deep down there's really nothing good about us. That's what God's word says. There's some deficiencies here. We don't have righteousness. We don't have understanding. We don't have good within us. Some major deficiencies. And then there's a character depravity that Paul begins to mention. Not only are we deficient in some ways, we're actually depraved in other ways. There's, there's some actions that we do that prove the problem. Romans chapter 3, their throat is an open grave. Verse 13, their throat is an open grave. I read a lot of commentators this week on this and was praying through it. And said, God, what do, you, what do we do with this? How do we understand this? How can we apply it? How can we make it real? We're just going to kind of walk through these just a little bit. We'd rather say things that tear down than things that lift up. The words that come out of our throat, the words that we say, are words that are actually destructive rather than words that are encouraging, helpful. We may think we're being helpful, but the truth is we'd rather tear somebody down than pick somebody up. Our focus is all about what they're doing wrong and how their life needs to change rather than on, God, what do I need to grow in? Which again, references back what Paul just said. We don't really understand our own messes. We're all about everyone else's, and we're very quick to point that out. We'd rather say things that tear down than things that lift up. They use their tongues to deceive, Paul says in Romans chapter 3, verse 13. They use their tongues to deceive, okay? So talk about this, this whole context, our throat is an open grave. The words we say, right, coming out of us, it's this idea of death, we're, we're destructive. And here's what happens. If we had to twist things to make that happen, so be it. We use our tongues to deceive. And we do twist things. We twist things to put us in a better light. We twist things to put others in a worse light. We twist things all the time. Paul says all of us are guilty of this. There's not a one who isn't. And so if we sit there and think, well, I'm, you know what? I'm not, I'm not really guilty of that. I'm pretty good on that. Well, I would go back to God's word who says and which says we use our tongues to deceive. And I would say, well, I would tend to trust God's word over man's opinion, Right? So what does that mean? Well, that means that your pastor has twisted words sometimes to make himself be better. That's what that means. And it's true. But that means everyone in this room has also done the same thing. And that's also true. We've also twisted our words to make someone else feel worse. We talked about gossip and slander not too long ago. Gossip, the idea that, you know, whether it's true or not, doesn't matter, it was unfavorable information, so we couldn't wait to share it with somebody. So sharing some unfavorable information about someone else, even if it's true. Or slander, ascribing the heart motives to somebody else. I know exactly why you did that. And this is why you did it. You did it on purpose. Whether they did or not, you have no way of knowing. But the Bible does say that all of us twist the words. We use our tongues to deceive. All of us are guilty of it. I don't like Romans. All right, the venom of asps is under their lips. What does this mean? Well, the venom of apps is poisonous, obviously. Under their lips, underlying everything they do, is we don't care that the result may be harmful to other people. We don't really care that the things we say, the words coming out of our mouth, the gossip, the slander, we truly don't care that these things are actually harming other people. We may, of course, deceive ourselves. Well, I'm just doing it to be helpful. This is what I'm trying to do. Others, people, they need to understand this, but you're hurting people. And to hurt people is something that really can't be justified. The poison of asps is under your lips. It's here. It's prevalent, right? It's in churches across America. It's in homes across America. It's in workplaces across America. It's there. It's in relationships all around the world. This is how people interact with one another. But the truth is, if we're honest with ourselves, oh my goodness, God, yep. Yep, I'm there. Their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. Well, I don't curse. Okay, I understand that. But God says your mouth is full of curses and bitterness. I'm going to say it this way. It's all driven by bitterness. Here's the thing. While you may be able to say, you know, I've never cursed, never done anything like that, okay? All of us, and again, going back to God's word, we've got man's opinion versus God's word. God says their mouth is full of curses and bitterness. He says in God's word in there that there are a lot of things we do to our brother that's like cursing him. 
there are also things that we do that reveals bitterness within us. All of us struggle with this a little bit. Is bitterness a real thing? Yes, it is. And what does bitterness lead to? Bitterness leads, or is a by, it sometimes is a byproduct of being hurt, but then once you're hurt, you tend to lash out. As we said before, hurting people hurt people, right? This is what we do. Hurting people hurt people. So if you find yourself thinking, man, God, you're right. I have put people down. I have done that. I have shared things that while it was true, was, maybe wasn't necessary to share with that specific person. I, I have knocked, I have hurt people through the words that I've said. And then God says, yes, and there's bitterness there. We may have to ask ourselves, God, what am I bitter about? What hurt have I not dealt with in my own life that needs to be dealt with? Their feet are swift to shed blood. We all know people like that. There are days we are people like this, where the truth is that we are quick to attack others. We're quick to do it. We want to be right, and it's more important to be right than it is to love on somebody. We are quick to attack others. God says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, he says that we should love each other because love covers a multitude of sins. We should earnestly love each other. Our response should not be to lash out. Our response should not be to attack. Our response should be to love. But unfortunately, that's not a righteous response, and we have what? No righteousness. So again, the natural response is to attack, and that's what we do. And then what happens is in their paths are ruin and misery. And so you look back on their lives, and the end result is this. In our wake is a history of hurt people where we can go back and we can see person after person after person that we've hurt. Now, right now, you may not see that. Sometimes it takes help. You know, one of the things about AA is, is recognizing the people that you've hurt and then going back and making amends for that. That's what they make you do. Sometimes I think we as believers need to do that very same thing, to go back and make amends. But the truth is we don't want to see the hurt that we've caused. Because we perceive ourselves as doing these things out of acts of righteousness, but God says you don't have righteousness. And we don't understand. Which is exactly what God says, no one understands. But in the end, in our, his, in our wake is a history of hurt people. Again, I don't like Romans. All right. The way of peace they have not known. How do I explain this one? As I was thinking through this and praying through this, God, what does peace look like in somebody's life? And I could think of, okay, when the times in my life when I wasn't at peace, what was that like? How was that personified? And I can remember one night, this was several years ago, I remember one night I woke up in the middle of the night. I used to wake up in the mornings with headaches, right? I couldn't understand why I was waking up with headaches. And I woke up one night, and I was so tense, my head was touching my pillow, and my feet were touching the bed, but nothing else in my body was touching the bed. I was so tense, I was just arching my back, holding myself up, sleeping, trying to sleep with just my neck and my feet. Somebody who has no peace is lying awake at night. That's where I was. Lying awake at night, thinking through this crazy situation that truth is, was completely out of my control. I had no ability to fix it. It wasn't even mine to fix. It wasn't my problem. And yet I was trying to. And I was lying awake at night, stressed. I, like, I wake up angry. I'd wake up shaking. My wife will tell you at times that I wake up so mad I was shaking over a situation happened. Guys, this is somebody who didn't have peace. There have been times in my own life when I recognized, man, God, I did not have peace. Why? Because I wasn't willing to deal with my own stuff. I was trying to deal with somebody else's stuff. When I try to deal with somebody else's stuff, they are completely out of my control. And all I became was more and more bitter because the situation wasn't changing because I couldn't change the situation because they were out of my control. Does this make sense? And yet we still do it to ourselves all the time. The only person we can change, we say this couples all the time, the only person you can change in any relationship is you. You can't change your kids, your spouse, your coworker, your, your deacons, your Sunday school teacher, your person next to you in church, your pastor. You can't change anybody. The only person you can change is you. So why stress at night about the other person? Breathe, people. My wife had great advice. After seven years, I asked her, how do you handle being married to me for so long? Valium. Lots of Valium. It was an instant response, and it was hurtful. But you know what? Sometimes, <laughs> please don't take that advice. That's not biblical, all right? I'm just saying. 
Sometimes we just need to breathe, folks. But the truth is, this is where we are, isn't it? We wake up stressed about stuff. And God says, you don't have peace. And there is no fear of God before their eyes. The way of peace they have not known, there is no fear of God before their eyes. What does this mean for us? What does this look like? Well, the truth is this. It is more important for us to do what we want to do than to do what God wants us to do. And it is much easier for me to point out somebody else's life than for me to deal what's in my life. Right? It is. And that's true for all of us. And so we then begin to think, well, this is, I'm here. I'm a truth speaker. This is my job is to do all these different things. This is what God wants me to do. And God says, okay, if that's the way you want to go, just understand, of course, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, the measure by which you judge, you will also be judged. So then it sounds like a pretty good idea to forgive as I have forgiven you, says God. That seems like a pretty good standard to follow. The whole standard of loving because what? Love covers a multitude of sins. What's it imply? It implies somebody is going to hurt you. If you get hurt and you're upset over that, well, congratulations, God's word is still true. You've been hurt. Now what do you do with that? You forgive. But it's more important to do what we want to do than what God wants us to do. And finally, our character destination. What does this result in? Here we go. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. So that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. I'm going to walk through these. We're going to read it one more time. I'm going to just blow right through them. We know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. So that every mouth may be stopped. Okay, you're going to have nothing to say. And the whole world may be held accountable to God. Here's what I know. I know that we're going to be held accountable. God is going to hold us accountable not for what our spouses did or our children did or the co-worker did or the pastor did or the deacons did or whoever did. It's going to be held accountable for what you did. Congratulations. Ouch. And we're not going to have any appeal. There's not going to be any sitting, but God, but God, but God, you don't understand, but God. And God says, no, I said you don't understand. There is no appeal. Your mouth will be stopped. It's going to be God who judges us, and frankly, there is absolutely nothing we can do about it. It's going to come, and there's nothing we can do about it. He says this in verse 20. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. So there is not enough good that I can do to remove the bad that I did. If I am tried in a murder case and I am there on trial, I cannot tell the judge. I said, judge, sure, I killed that person, but you don't understand. There was 253 other people that day that drove me bonkers, and I didn't kill any of them, so just let me go on this. It was a good thing I didn't kill them, right? Yeah, it's a good thing, but it doesn't erase what you did. I cannot do anything good to erase the bad that I did, okay? Do we understand that? And that's what he's saying. Look, there's nothing you can do. There are no works that will erase the bad works. There are no good works that erase the bad works. You're not going to be justified. The law only points out the fact that you're a broken person, and you're messed up, and all of us are screwed up. And I don't like Romans 3. Okay, moving on. Here we go. Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, even there was wickedness. And in the place of righteousness, even there was wickedness. I said in my heart, God will judge the righteous and the wicked, for there is a time for every matter and for every work. Let's rephrase this just a minute. We're going to use the Daniel Bear uninspired version, all right? Moreover, I saw under the sun that in the place of justice, that is, in the court systems, even there was wickedness. Is there wickedness and depravity in the court system? Yes, there is. In our justice system, there is. But let's go to the next phrase. In the place of righteousness, in the churches, in the synagogues, in the worship centers, there was wickedness. Okay, now we're just getting personal, all right? We just got to back off a little bit. Guys, I'm just reading what God's Word says. Where there's supposed to be righteousness, there is wickedness. Where there's supposed to be justice, there is wickedness. The minute you find a perfect church and begin attending it, you are no longer in a perfect church because you're attending it, right? I mean, that's the truth. There is no such thing as a perfect church because people are not perfect. Do not expect to come into grace and not be hurt by somebody. It's going to happen. What are you going to do with it when it does? That's where the rubber meets the road. Are we going to choose to love and forgive even when we don't want to? 
Because the truth is, God will judge the righteous and the wicked. There's a time for every matter and for every work. All right. Paul brings in this idea of God, being held accountable to God. And he begins now in verses 21. For just a second, we're going to look at verses 21, first part of verse 22. Some of this, some of God's character. God's character displayed, God's character distributed. This is kind of fun. But now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, though the law and the prophets bear witness to it. Okay, remember, we don't have righteousness. Okay, all the way back to verse 10. None is righteous, no, not one. We don't have righteousness. But then Paul says, but now the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The law and the prophets show that God is righteous, we are not. All right, but God has shown it to us apart from the law. What do we know? God's righteousness is displayed apart from the law. The law cannot justify. We cannot receive righteousness through the law. God's righteousness is shown outside of the law. Apart from the law, God's righteousness is shown. What do we know? We know the law reveals sin. The law doesn't remove sin. We know there's a standard. We know we don't meet the standard. The law shows us a standard. We know none of us have met it. We have a problem. God shows his righteousness apart from that. He says, look, I'm not going to save you using the law. I'm just using the law to show that you need to be saved, that you need me as a God. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. And this is the best thing in the whole, whole of God's word. This message right here is that all it is is faith. Do you believe in a God who gave his son, Jesus Christ, to die for us so that you could be declared righteous? You aren't righteous, but you are declared righteous. Do you see the difference? God looks at us and says, yeah, you're messed up, but you have placed your faith in my son. His righteousness is now imputed in you, and you're good. For all who believe, God's righteousness is displayed through the distribution available through his son's death. Hebrews 9.22, without the shedding of blood, there can be no forgiveness of sins. Christ shed his blood so there can be forgiveness of sins. His righteousness is distributed to us. 1 John chapter 4, verse 10, and this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins, the appeasement for our sins, the payment for our sins. Our sins are covered because of God. That is God's righteousness imputed to us, distributed to us, given to us through his son's death. All we have to do is receive it by faith. I can't work for it. I can't earn it. I just have to recognize I need it. And dear God, do I need it. Every single one of us does. Truth is, all of us need God. Every one of us needs God. What do we do with this? Well, the Bible says we're messed up. We are messed up people. That's what God says. We look at ourselves, and we may not like to see that. We may not even recognize it in ourselves. But the truth is, we are messed up. And if you go to somebody feeling all pious that you're good, you are messed up. And they can go to this passage and say, look, you know what, you're judging me, but frankly, none is righteous, no, not one. Let's talk about you for a minute. See how that conversation goes. We don't want to hear that, do we? God isn't. This is the good news. I messed up, but God isn't. So then I have to ask myself, who am I going to trust? Am I going to trust that I'm right? And the things that I do, I'm going to trust that God is right, one, in his condemnation of me, but two, in his payment for me. What am I going to do with this? The worship team is going to come up here, and they're going to lead us a song. Lord, I need you. And we do need God every single day. And I pray that if you, at this moment, if you've recognized even now or at a point in the past that you have needed God for salvation, I pray the truth of this song would just come blazing out through you as you, with joy, are reminded of that moment. But maybe today you're sitting there thinking, said, I don't know if I've ever recognized that I need God. I don't know if I've ever recognized that I messed up. Maybe during this song you might cry out to God for salvation, saying, Lord, I need you and your righteousness. God, we come to you today, Lord. We are all broken people. Father, I pray that you would just help us right now as we're just absorbing where our hearts are, contemplating this whole thing. God, may we cry out, Lord, I need you. We need you every day for guidance. We need you every day for your righteousness. Lord, we understand 
that there's a moment in our life when we can, when many of us here have actually placed their faith in you for their forgiveness of sin, for their righteousness. There are some here today who have never done that. Maybe today they say, you know what, God, I realize I am messed up. I can't fix it. God, save me. And for those who've already made that decision, Lord, I pray that we would sing this song out from our hearts, crying out to you, Lord, I need you, recognizing just the, from welling up within, the joy of knowing that while we are not righteous, we have been declared righteous. And there is a peace that comes from that, that lets us sleep at night, resting in your arms. Lord, I just pray that you would just let this worship rise to you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please rise. Father, I trust that will be our prayer this week and a constant reminder of how much we need you. You are our defense. You are also our righteousness. Father, I praise you for your righteousness. God, I know that I am an unrighteous person. I know that all of us in this room, we struggle with sins in our lives. But Lord, you look at us, and because of your son and what he did, you declare us righteous through no merit of our own. And God, I praise you. Oh, how I praise you for that. Because God, because of you, I can sleep. And I can rest in these promises. God, as we leave this place today, stick around for Sunday school, Lord, I pray that you would just help us to be encouraged by the truth of your word. That you are a good God who loves us and has given us a great thing through no merit of our own, all because of your love. 
God, may we praise you and worship you all this week because of that promise. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a great week.